Hello everyone, this is Direwolf20, and welcome to part two of Direwolf20's Mod Spotlight on RF Tools. Uh, today's episode is going to cover most of the stuff we didn't cover last episode, with the exception of the Dimension Builder, which we'll get to in part three. So, uh, things to take a look at today. We've got a bunch of logic gates that come with this mod, and it even has its wireless redstone system that you can use, uh, similar to wireless redstone systems that you've seen in the past. But it can also integrate with things uh, like modular screens, which we'll check out in a minute as well. We'll also be taking a look at things like the item filter, the power generation system that they have, environmental control spawner system, and the builder, which is really kind of cool. It allows you to build structures, and it also allows you to move existing structures in the world. It's a neat system. It's brand new in version 3.0, um, so you're going to want to be a little bit careful with it because it's a, you know, a brand new feature, but it's still pretty awesome, and I'll show it to you. So without further ado, let's get started. I'm going to go with logic gates first, and we can take a look at the sequencer, the timer, the counter, the ender monitor, and the wireless redstone system. All right, the first complicated redstone logic gate that we're going to take a look at is called the sequencer. Now, when you first see the interface, you're probably going to think it's very scary, but it's actually really simple to use. Okay, the way this works is um, there is going to be a delay in number of ticks that you can specify, and you can either fill or clear the grid. Uh, so let's specify, for example, 20 ticks, which is one second. Now, every second, it's going to activate one of these blocks represented here in the interface. So second one will be here, second two will be here, second three will be here, etc. So we'll say um, we'll enable this, and then a second off, two seconds off, three seconds off, and then second four will be on, second five and six will be on, and then second seven will be off, eight off, and then nine on. That sound cool? Let's see what happens. So I'm going to flip the lever here, and we're going to activate it. So one two, oh, see it was off real quick, so it only lasted a second, and then three seconds, and then it's off, and it goes back on for about three seconds, and then it's off, and then it goes back on for two seconds, or one second, whatever I specified there, right? So pretty cool, you can specify the sequence. Now right now, it's going through all these, so flipping this lever will do nothing. Okay, because it's still going through all these processes. But there's several options we can choose down here. When a redstone signal is received, loop the cycle once. Ignore further pulses. That's what it's doing right now. So it's ignoring those extra signals until it gets through all these disabled steps. You might not want that setting because it's going to take a while to get through all those disabled steps uh, until it gets to the very end when it can receive the redstone signal again. So let's go ahead and change that. We're going to, uh, when a redstone signal is received, loop the cycle once restart if a new pulse arrives. So let's do it again. One second on, three seconds off, three seconds on, two seconds off. So let's see, one second on, three seconds off, three seconds on, two seconds off, and then one second on. Okay, and now when we flip this, it starts the cycle over again. So one second on, it's in the middle of doing three seconds off, but I'll just flip the signal. There we go. Now it just started over again. There's other options. Uh, loop the cycle all the time. Ignore redstone signals. So it'll just keep looping over and over and over again, regardless of what redstone signal comes in. Loop the cycle all the time. Restart on redstone pulse. So it'll continuously loop this cycle, but if it receives a redstone pulse, it'll start over again. And then loop the cycle when redstone signal is present, continue at current step. Pretty cool. So you can actually set it so that you can stop it when the signal's gone. Notice it's just maintaining that power. And it'll pick up where it left off when you put the lever back on. Nice. And then finally, uh, loop the cycle when redstone signal is presented, is present, restart on no signal. So instead of when the signal turns off, it just stays on the current step. In this case, it'll um, you know, stop. And then do one step in the cycle for every redstone pulse. Cool. So you could actually have it so that when it starts over here, it'll go one on a pulse and then off on a pulse, off on a pulse, off on a pulse, another redstone pulse on, 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 etc. Pretty nifty little device that allows for some really powerful customization of how redstone signals are emitted from it. You can see there might be a lot of really cool uses if you're a big redstone fanatic. And keep in mind that all this is explained in the book, so if you need to remember how the sequencer works, definitely look through the book. It'll remind you of how these different modes works. Let's look at the timer now. That's a little bit more easy. So this interface, far more simple. Maybe I should have started with the timer. Eh, we'll see. Uh, the timer delay is currently set to 20 ticks, which is one second. So every second, it's emitting a redstone pulse, we can see here. If we set it to 60 ticks, for example, it'll be every three seconds that it emits a redstone pulse. Cool. Now the nice thing about this block is that you can also um, reset that timer using a redstone signal. So if we flip this uh, lever every so often, 
at least once every three seconds, it'll never emit a redstone signal as a pulse. Nice. However, if the, there's no redstone signal for those three seconds, it will pulse. Very cool. So you can have it uh, as low as one tick. Um, so we can see here, this thing's gonna go uh, pretty quickly. Two ticks, yeah, pretty, pretty rapid pulsing. Um, and then all the way up to like, you know, if we did 100, it would be every five seconds, whatever you want. And finally, we can talk about the counter. Uh, this is a pretty nice device. Uh, set the counter pulses and the current number that it is. So we can make it so that after five pulses, for example, it will emit a redstone signal. So let's try it. Pulse one, pulse two, pulse three, pulse four, and then pulse five will emit the redstone signal. Nice. And currently it's on pulse zero. So if we pulse again, it starts over. Not bad, right? So a pretty simple way to count how many redstone pulses you get. Now the next item in the logic gate category is the ender monitor, but that relates to the power generation system, so we're going to skip that one and go directly to redstone transmitter. This is the wireless redstone system that I mentioned to you guys before. It'll wirelessly send a redstone signal on a specific channel when it gets a redstone signal. Not bad. Uh, so we can go ahead and check out how this thing works. So uh, let's get our wireless receiver here and wireless transmitter here and take a look. So we'll grab ourselves a lever and I believe what we're gonna wanna do is shift right click one on the other. And here I am forgetting which one it is but I think it might be the receiver on the sender maybe. There we go, channel set to one, nice. Uh, so shift right click the receiver on the transmitter and it'll work. Power 15, power 15, power 14, nice. Do note that this block acts as a repeater, so you'll notice power 13 going in, power 15 coming out, so it kind of, you know, resets the strength as it goes through the wireless redstone system. So a pretty simple way to transmit wireless redstone signals. I like it. Now, let's jump into, since I already mentioned it, the power generator system. So guys, the award for most complex energy generation system goes to RF tools. This is a very complex system, and it's not for those who are faint of heart and want something that's very simple. However, it is a lot of fun to set up, it's very customizable, it's very manipulable, and uh, you'll wind up generating a decent amount of energy from it if you can get it perfectly configured. Now, I could probably spend at least 15 or 20 minutes talking about the in-depth details to the endergenic generator, how it works and what it does. Uh, but you'll notice right now there's a bunch of complicated redstone going on and it's all running. So why don't we talk briefly about how this endergenic generator works? Basically, uh, it's going to function off of um, what's called the uh, power of ender pearls, basically. And you'll notice that they're running pretty well right now. Yeah, all kinds of cool stuff going on. I uh, am definitely gonna need to play with the system a little bit more to get a better understanding for it. Basically, the concept is every time you throw an ender pearl and it wants to teleport the player, it's generating or using a bunch of energy within that ender pearl, the act of throwing it from one location to another. So you basically need two endergenic generators that toss ender pearls between each other, and they are capable of generating a decent amount of energy. Cool. How does it work? Well, it's a little bit complicated. First, you've got your endergenic generators here and here. I'm gonna get rid of these guys and replace them just so you guys, and you can tell I've probably done this a few times trying to figure out how it works because it is pretty complicated, okay? Basically, the way this works is you need to tell the generator here where to throw the ender pearl here. And this generator is actually going to throw it back. And you'll notice that when you do this, it tells you how many, t how long in ticks it's gonna take for the ender pearl to reach from here over to here. The other thing you need to do is supply the endergenic generator with a redstone signal. Now there are three modes that an endergenic generator can be in. Idle mode means it's doing nothing. It's just sitting there, nothing's happening. When it receives a redstone signal, it goes into charging mode. Now this is a 15 tick cycle, so it's about three quarters of a second. Okay, and what's going to happen is if it receives a redstone or if it receives an ender pearl thrown from one generator to the other within that 15 tick cycle, it's going to capture the pearl and start generating RF with it. And if it receives a redstone signal after that, it will throw the pearl to the next generator. Okay, now the tick at which it arrives is important 
for how the energy is produced. If it arrives too early in the 15 tick cycle, it won't produce much. Tick 10, I believe, is the optimal time for the pearl to arrive. So basically, you want the pearl to show up on the 10th tick of the endogenic cycle, okay? So this complicated redstone schematic, which I did not come up with, it's on the wiki for RF tools as a basic functionality, works like so. This timer, every one second, is going to pulse this block here, the pearl injector, which we haven't talked about just yet, but this is how you feed ender pearls into the system. And you're going to want to toss a lot of them in there. When this receives a redstone signal, it's going to drop it into the energetic generator. The first thing it's going to do is kick that thing off to its adjacent uh, energetic generator. So four ticks it takes. So the pearl goes in here, it immediately launches it, and in four ticks, it'll land over here. Okay. So at some point, we need to tell this thing to start its charging cycle. Okay. And the way that happens is at the same time this pulse occurs, a redstone signal goes down here to a sequencer which is basically a one tick delay to say, hey, start your charging cycle, okay? So the pulse occurs, one tick later, this thing starts its charging cycle, and it takes four ticks for the pearl to leave this generator and land in this one, cool? At that point, we've got the ender monitor, which I mentioned earlier. It's set up in pearl arrived mode, and it will send a redstone signal out when a pearl arrives in the generator. The signal will do two things, one, it will go over to the sequence here, and after about two ticks, it'll send a redstone signal to the endogenic generator saying, hey, go ahead and shoot your pearl back to the one that it came from. It'll also come over here, make sure this guy's in charging mode. He should be because this sequencer also ensures he's in charging mode. So this signal should really do nothing. I think it's just like a backup. And it'll also tell the timer, hey, don't run again because you've, uh, we've already got a pearl bouncing around in the system back and forth. Okay, so this guy sits in charging mode. What he's going to do is he's going to, Pearl arrived, send a redstone signal out telling this guy to go into charging mode one tick later, and it'll also bounce back to this sequencer saying, hey, in about two or three ticks, go ahead and shoot your redstone, your um, ender pearl back to that one. So they basically bounce back and forth. And the time that the pearl is in the generator is the time that it's actually generating power. You'll also notice that this is more than 15 blocks all the way back to here, so we don't shoot another pearl when this uh, signal occurs. However, uh, the timer, if it doesn't receive a redstone signal for over a second, meaning that probably what happened is one, there's a 1% 1 chance, I think it is, every tick for the pearl to be destroyed in the process. So you uh, basically have a random chance for that pearl being destroyed. It might happen early, it might happen late. So if there's about a full second goes by with no activity on this redstone signal system, it'll go ahead and launch another pearl. So it's a pretty complex system, uh, but I don't know exactly how much power you can generate out of this, but the theoretical level of this uh, system is that you can get about 1400 RF a tick and it uses an inner pearl every seven seconds on average. And this is an extremely not optimal system. This is only using two energetic generators. You could have more, so you could have an energetic generator going from one, bouncing to another, bouncing to another, bouncing to another, bouncing back. Um, the maximum distance between two generators is four ticks, so you can't do any better than that. But if you really had some complicated redstone logic and played around a lot with the sequencer, the ender monitors, and the timer, you could probably generate a lot more power than just 1400 RF a tick. Um, so the other thing to mention about this system is there is an infusion aspect, which we haven't talked about yet. We'll talk about that when we get to the dimension system, but that also increases the amount of power it can generate. So these things have the potential to generate a large amount of power, but you have to build some complicated systems and that's kind of fun to do. So let's turn it on and see what happens. Boom, pulses occur and the redstone signals are uh, shooting over there and all kinds of cool stuff is happening. You can see uh, energetic generators are generating power when they've got the purple particle effects. And I think when the black particle effects occur is when a uh, pearl is lost. So you can see here, there's no pulses occurring until one of those black particle effects occur. And then a pulse occurs here on the timer and that's when it allows it to run again. And you can also right click on the energetic generator and see how much over the last five seconds RF is being generated, pearls that were lost, pearls that were launched, that kind of thing. So like I said, this is by no means um, a very in-depth tutorial on how the power gen system works. That might have to wait for something a little bit more uh, advanced, but I think for now you guys have the basic gist of how it works. And uh, if you have any questions or confusions, definitely check out the wiki or read up on the power generator in the book. 
All right, guys, I just uh, probably blew your minds a little bit with some complex mechanics, so let's get back to some more basic and easy ones, hopefully to give your brains a little bit of a rest. Let's take a look at this nifty block, the item filter. Uh, this is kind of a buffer slash filter that allows you to sort items uh, in some pretty nifty ways. Uh, we can take a look here and see that we've got uh, an item input going into the south side there. Um, there we go, we connect that. So the north side is this chest, and the west side is this chest. If we look in the interface, we'll see that we have several options. I've filtered on this column, cobblestone. I say cobblestone's allowed to enter this block on the south side, and uh, it's allowed to leave the block on the north side. And I've also configured that chests are allowed to enter on the south side, but they can only leave on the west side. Got it? So let's go ahead and put some chests in here and see what happens. Boom. The chests will hang out in this internal buffer slot right here. Now uh, I could go ahead and tell this side that you can start pulling out, but notice it doesn't pull out the chests because that is the north side. We said that only the west side are allowed to outport things in this column. So let's go ahead and activate this guy and boom, the chests were allowed to leave. Sweet. And the same will be done for cobblestone. Uh, notice that the cobblestone quickly moves its way into this chest. So you can configure which side of the block are allowed to input and output items and filter different items on different sides. A really cool mechanic that you could have a lot of fun with. Okay guys, and now for something completely different. Let's take a look at screens. Screens are a way to read information about blocks in your base and display them in a nice and friendly interface and manner. Uh, first off, you just place the screen in the world as I have. So you can see here, if I shift right click it, you just right click, boom, screens in the world, okay? Uh, you can right click with a wrench to make the screen invisible. You can also make it larger and invisible, or you can make it larger and not invisible. Sweet. Uh, so that's a pretty nice looking screen. I believe that's the largest size it can be. So you can see there, those are the four options. Invisible, you'll notice that there is actually um, another invisible block here, right? So it's four, by, it's a two by two and it's invisible or it's a two by two and it's solid. So what can you do with this? Well, you right click on the screen and you have many modules that you can install. But before you do that, you're probably going to hook up a screen controller to some kind of power system. Boom, right there. So the screen controller needs power. He doesn't have to actually be touching the screens. Uh, all you have to do is hit scan here and you'll see it found one screen. Nice. So now this guy is connecting. You'll notice on the uh, whale interface, it's telling us up there, connected power consuming zero RF per tick. Nice. If you wanted to, you can detach this guy, and you'll notice that he's no longer connected, according to Whaler. Hooray! So what can we put on here? Well, many things. First, we can put a text module in. Nice and simple. Hello, everyone. Ta-da! Text module. Uh, you can configure it to be large text or small text, as you can see here. And you can also change the color. Pretty simple but also kind of boring. Let's look at something more complicated and fun. Uh, let's take a look at the energy module. So all you have to do is uh, shift right click on a machine that uses energy. So let's say this resonant energy cell over here. That sounds like a nice one to put in. We'll place this guy here and we'll open up the configuration. So we'll call this resonant energy cell and we'll make it a blue text color. And ta-da, resonant energy cell with how much RF is currently stored in there. So we can see, yep, that matches pretty well. If you wanted to, you can configure the uh, RF. So right now we're showing the amount of RF and we're showing a full format. But if we wanted to, we could do a compact format, 80 million RF, or we could have a comma-based format. Nice, very cool. And if you wanted to, you could also show RF per tick. So what the gain or loss of that machine is. So if it was consuming power, it would tell you zero RF per tick versus 100, whatever. And you can also show percentages, so 100%. You'll also notice that that bar is showing, um, you know, how much it is. Um, there we go. So let's actually connect this to something else that doesn't have quite so much power, and we'll see a little bit more fancy stuff. So we will snag this module, set it to that guy, put it right back in, and we will configure this to output to the right. Notice now we're seeing it filling up. 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%. Uh, and of course, if we wanted to show RF, there we go. Nice. I like the comma format. You could also go the compact one if you wanted to. Whatever you want. Sweet, right? Um, so you can also have it change the color of uh, text. So if it's green, 
it's increasing, and it would be red if it was decreasing. Also cool. So briefly, I'll mention that the energy module, uh, which uses four RF protect to display its information, uh, has a range of about 64 blocks. But if you want more range, then you can go ahead and get the energy plus module. And uh, there's several of these blocks that have plus module versions. Those uh, have no range, but they obviously require more RF protect. So this could measure something much further away than 64 blocks. So the next module to show you is the inventory module. I've already shift right clicked on this chest over here. You'll notice slot zero has screen controllers, slot two has cobblestone, and slot three has my angel wings. Nice. Uh, so you can change which slot you're looking at. So if you want the first one to be displayed as two, and then zero, and then one, you get it, right? So you specify which slot you want to monitor up to four in total, and you can see on that row everything that's being made available in the chest. It's very cool. And it dynamically updates, of course. I like it. The next module is the clock module. It just shows you what time of day it is. Fluid modules, very much like the RF module, you can label it. And show how much millibuckets is in there. Right now, 1,000. It's linked to that creative one back there, which has a maximum of 1,000. You can show MB per tick gain or loss. You can show MB percentage etc. Um, and you can also do the format, right? So compact formats if you want, if you're in the uh, MB1. One, you know, 1,000 millibuckets versus 1,000 millibuckets. Cool? Very spiffy. Remember earlier we said that counters can keep track of the number of times it's received a signal. So the current counter is 2. If we have a counter module linked to it, we can see it's currently set to two. Give it a label, um, color for the label, color for the counter, what kind of format it's in, etc. I've just configured uh, some wireless transmitters, frequency channel two, and we get myself some levers and some redstone. And we can monitor this using the redstone module. So I can go ahead and shift right click on either one. It doesn't matter, the sender or the receiver. And uh, just drop it in there. And we will label this wireless. And positive text, active, no, dead. And you can even set the colors for these guys if you wanted to. So we'll make active be green and dead be red. Cool. Let's go ahead and see. Currently it is dead, now it is active, now it is dead, now it is active. Spiffy, I like it. But hey, wouldn't it be nice if I could control this directly? You can, button module, link it to a receiver, boom. Create a channel for button module, receiver is set to channel three. So now this guy is no longer linked here, by the way. Okay, it's its own separate frequency, keep that in mind. Um, and you can go ahead and put your button module in here and we will label this activate. Um, and we can have the button text be go. And it can be green and we'll make this one blue. Activate, go. Ready? It's quick. It's just a pulse. Unless, of course, you change it from toggle and then when you click it, uh, go is on and you left click again, go is off. Sweet. By the way, you can combine this, this, and the teleport system. Remember there was a teleporter that could receive a redstone signal? You could set up a bunch of buttons to change the destination of your teleporter here. You could say like Dyer's base, Soren's base, Pahamar's base, click the button, it activates a different wireless receiver frequency per button which activates a different dialer, which dials your transmitter to different locations. Ooh, fancy. So one other thing you can connect to is the machine information module. Several uh, machines are available. You'll have to check out which ones are all. I've linked it to my matter transmitter, which is this guy, and where it's dialed to. Uh, so you can inf gather information like which dimension it's currently dialed to, dimension zero. You can also have it display the coordinates in that dimension that it's dialed to, or you can have it show the name, Dire Home. Remember in episode one, we named the receiver over here, Dire Home. Nice. And if we uh, change this guy from sender, we'll interrupt it, and we'll link him to the death destination, TP to death. Cool. So combine that with the uh, button thing that I just talked about, and you can easily see where your current destination is and change it with a button press. That would be pretty cool. 
And finally, there's a computer module. You'll note that it tells you here, um, tags used by Lua to identify module. You can configure this with ComputerCraft. Something I haven't talked about yet, many of these blocks have ComputerCraft APIs. So the dialing device, you can wrap with ComputerCraft and you can build your own dialer by sending commands through ComputerCraft to the dialing device. So as you can see, you can get transmitter count, get transmitter, get receiver count, get receiver, get receiver name. So if we did something like get receiver name, I think zero, death. Get receiver name of one, dire home. Cool. And then we can uh, dial, or if we uh, wanted to, we could get transmitter name zero, sender one. So we could do a p dot dial zero to one, and it should go ahead and dial this guy over to dire home. And remember a moment ago, it was death. And if we wanted to, we could uh, switch that up to zero, zero, and now it should be dialed to death. So cool stuff if you're into computer craft, you can do some neat things with it. Environmental control, this is a neat block. Think of it as an RF powered beacon. That's pretty much what it is. Uh, you can set the radius in blocks, so you can bump it all the way up to 100 blocks or all the way down to 5. Uh, we'll leave it at 50 for now, and the minimum and maximum height that it affects. So right now I'm at Y level 69, so let's change that height to 60 to 70. That works. Cool. Uh, and you'll notice right now it's consuming 0 RF per tick, and it tells you on your whale tooltip where you're at. Nice. So we'll shrink this down to something like five block radius. Yeah. So the larger the radius, obviously, the more power it's going to consume. And you can toggle whether or not it requires redstone to activate. And there's a bunch of modules you can install here, like the regeneration module. Gives regeneration, gives regeneration three. I know way of time, we'll hate this thing. Ooh, fancy. Um, we can go ahead, of course, uh, as we're standing inside the radius, we've got it. You can see regeneration three going on here, constantly being reapplied to my character. That's kind of nice. But if we step outside the realm of that area, uh, regeneration three will not rebuff. It only happens when you're inside of it. So it's pretty much like a beacon, but it requires RF. Right now it's consuming five RF a tick, but obviously if I bumped up the radius, up oh, 400 RF a tick almost, and if we wanted to adjust the height to something like 20 to 70, all right, we're using 1800 RF a tick. So clearly the radius of this thing will heavily influence how much RF per tick is used. Um, and of course, having more things in there will also affect it. So right now we're back down, uh, let's bump it up here to about a radius of 25. If we were to throw in a speed boost, and also throw in the haste module. Sure, why not? Saturation, ooh, I like the sound of that. Nice. Uh, already up to 289 RF a tick. So you can see, ooh, feather falling. I definitely don't want to take damage when I fall. Ooh, flight module, yes please. Uh, peaceful mode, this mode prevents hostile mobs from spawning. That's cool. Water breathing module, night vision module, cool. But we're already up to 439 RF a tick. And if we bumped up the radius here, you know, we could see quickly getting where we need to go, but hey, I've got some cool abilities. Hooray! So uh, nifty environmental controller. Obviously, the larger the radius you want to affect and the more um, buffs you want to put in there, clearly you're going to have, uh, you know, a cost of power. All right, guys, let's talk about the mob spawning system that's part of this mod. Uh, so there's an interesting mechanic you're going to need to figure out and play with, but don't worry, it's not too hard. Uh, let's get it going in just a moment here. So first, you're going to need a syringe, okay? This is how you're going to figure out which mobs you want to go ahead and uh, spawn. So let's get some skeletons. That sounds like a good one to draw some blood out of. Uh, left click to attack and draw the syringe and fill it up. You'll notice it's filling up in my hot bar there and eventually we'll get a lot of uh, fully leveled up syringe. Essence level 100, nice. Uh, so we can go ahead and use that in the spawner. When we place it in there, it's gonna tell us what we're gonna need to spawn skeletons. In this case, uh, for this guy, we're gonna need some bones. Oh good, I got some of those. We're also gonna need some dirt, a lot of it, 30 of them. Wow, that's a lot of dirt. And then the leaf texture is not necessarily leaves. In this case, it represents any uh, living material like wheat seeds or wheat. Uh, you can also use raw beef. There's a bunch of different ones we can use. Uh, from there, we're gonna need matter beamers. Now, I don't know if they have to be on the same level, but we're gonna find out. Ah, there we go, connected, cool. So you're gonna want one for each type of material. If you wanted to, you could have just you know one total, but it's probably best to have three, one for each type of material. 
Also note those infusion levels here. So you can uh, infuse these. We'll talk about infusion probably in the dimension spotlight, so part three. Um, so once these guys are all connected, which we can see all three of them in fact are, we just have to do this. So to get started, uh, place the bones in one slot. Notice you need 0.1 bones. So this should spawn 10 guys from the bones we're giving it. Uh, we're also gonna need dirt, but I'm only gonna give it enough dirt to spawn two skeletons. And then finally, uh, that you know, food matter type stuff. So we'll just use beef. Uh, apply a redstone signal to each matter beamer. There we go. And you'll notice that it's starting to fill up with living matter. Nice. And then we apply our redstone signal there. We'll see it's starting to fill up with bulk matter. That's the dirt. Uh, and then finally, the redstone signal for the bone. We can see we've got 1.0 there because we've only got one bone in the system. So once that bulk matter reaches 32, remember we needed, or 30 for the skeleton for dirt, uh, you'll see that it'll spawn a skeleton for us. A pretty nifty mechanic. So an interesting way, and of course this is using power, I've got creative energy cells here, but it does use power for all four of these blocks. So a pretty cool system for setting this up. And obviously they don't have to be set up in the pattern that I just dictated, they can kind of be put anywhere. Gray skeleton. And then of course it's gonna start beaming it up again. You'll notice that it used 0.1 of the bone, it's refilling the bulk matter, so we uh, will probably only get a few skeletons, two of them in total from this system, and uh, we've got plenty of living matter in there. Um, different types of materials, by the way, generate different amounts, so I'm using beef, but if you use something like wheat or seeds, it might be less living matter per item. Uh, so we should see another skeleton show up in about one second. Uh, all right, guys, and with that, I think we're going to wrap up the spotlight part two here. So I think we've covered everything that exists in the mod, except for the builder and the dimension builder. I said I was going to dedicate part three all to the dimension builder, but I think I'm going to wait to cover the builder there as well, uh, just because I think the builder will require a little bit of time, and we're pretty much out of time for this episode. So we'll wrap up here. Next episode, we'll talk about the builder and the dimension builder, and that should be pretty cool. So hope you guys enjoyed checking out part two of RF Tools. There's a lot of cool stuff in this mod, as I think you're probably coming to be aware of. The power system, like I said, definitely more advanced for some advanced users, but if you came up with a really good system and really got into some cool redstone mechanics, you could generate a lot of power from it. And also, I personally am a big fan of the screen, because I think we need more screens like this where you can actually interact with it. I mean, a lot of the times I build computer craft monitors, but that's for people who know Lua. There's really not much else in terms of options for that kind of thing. So having a way to uh, click on a screen with some nice text and uh, activating buttons and redstone signals is kind of nice. Not to mention all the other neat stuff we saw. All right, guys, for now, Daryl20 signing off. Hope you guys enjoyed the episode. Take it easy.